Okay, so uh, we looked at white lies a couple weeks ago, and we were looking at Romans 8.28, uh, and then that took us into talking about predestination. So for today's white light, I, I want to show you just a few different pictures. Um, there's this one right here. There's this one right here. And then there's this one right here. So if you look closely at the picture itself, you'll notice that all three of those pictures are the exact same place, the Sierra Blanca. They're just different places of Sierra Blanca. But if you noticed, all, of the, all three of those pictures, they showed a different aspect of Sierra Blanca. So it's the same picture. It, 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 I'm sorry, it, it, was, it was the same place. It just each of the pictures didn't show the whole. And sometimes we do the same thing with um, with the Bible uh, and with God. We, we kind of pick our favorite view, and then we just kind of whoosh, write off the rest of it. Like, for instance, um, let's say we get an idea of – well, I'll, I'll talk about it in just a second, so there's no reason I'm talking about it now. Um, so, But we pick our favorite view of God. Um, and when we, when we don't read the whole Bible, we see glimpses of, glimpses of God that we choose from. Like, let's say we, we never read the Old Testament because that's boring and hard to understand. But we read, like, the Gospel of Matthew and maybe, like, I don't know, 1 Corinthians or something like that. So then we just kind of get in this rut, you know, and we only see this limited picture. And then from that limited picture, we take the bits that we like and just kind of ignore the bits that we don't. Um, and so we, we kind of get to where we start choosing little bits and gl glimpses of God. Um, our favorite favorite view of God becomes uh, um, a new and fake one-dimensional God. So God says, okay, this is who I am. And we say, okay, I'm taking this one aspect and I'm avoiding the rest. And then I'm going to just kind of expound on that. So God is love. Okay, I'll take that. And then I'll say God can't do anything that I deem as hateful. God can't do anything that I deem as not, not loving. So now we, we kind of make God all one aspect and... We discredit anything else that doesn't meet that idea. And so we make God kind of a one-dimensional being, but then we also create a new God according to our own likeness, how, how we want him to be. Um, like, for instance, one thing that people said a lot was God wouldn't bring sickness when the, when the whole COVID thing started. God wouldn't bring sickness. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that COVID was from God. That's not my point at all. My point is simply this. The assertion that God wouldn't bring sickness is just false. The Bible talks all throughout the Old Testament, for instance, um, about God bringing sickness. He even talks about it in the New Testament too, you know, um, about bringing plagues and, for instance, the whole account of, of the slavery in Egypt thing. Or in the book of De Deuteronomy when he talks about, hey, if you guys do this, I'm going to bring the things that I brought on the Canaanites. Uh, or, you know, you fast forward again from there in the time of the prophets, again, talking about um, different things with sicknesses. So it's, it's not really um, a realistic uh, idea, um, but it's, it's that, that common view of God about how he is not um, – well, how he's this and nothing else. So some common glimpses that people have is God the love bug. <laughs> he, he doesn't judge. He doesn't bring justice. He's, justice. he's just a big pushover. He's spineless. He's squeamish at violence. He kind of throws up a little bit in his mouth every time that there's something that requires like immediate action. He's like, ugh, ugh. you know, he's just kind of a squeamish guy. Then another common view is God the dictator. He doesn't listen. He yells a lot. He only cares about the rules. So he's really by the book. He's like that that uh, detective on that show. You know, he's all, oh, get da, 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 da. Um, you know, he, he's kind of like there's no excuses. You know. Ugh. Uh, completely over dominating. He's a kind of a tyrant who just kind of lords it over people and just can't wait to squash people. Um, another common glimpse of God is God the hippie. Uh, he doesn't care how we live or act. He leaves us alone to spit on his mercy. It's all good, man. You know, none of these, some, all of these have a little glimpse of truth to them, but while drastically making it into something else. And I'll talk, I'll talk about what I mean in just a second. But uh, first off, um, when we're looking at aspects of God, they don't have to be at war with one another. Um, for instance, God is so much love and justice. And so these two aspects oftentimes seem contradictory. That looks like he's going to yeah. do the fan. Um, seem contradictory. So, like, for instance, okay, well, if God's loving, then he can't really do justice because, like, that would be, like, for instance, the killing of the Canaanites. That's just, that's evil. Or how could he have forgiven the Israelites uh, when they worshipped um other gods just like the Canaanites did. Oh, it doesn't really sound like he's a just God. And so you kind of have these these things and just, oh, uh, you know, contradictions with God rather than my understanding being, li being limited. 
Um, and so some people will just oversimplify the problem rather than admitting that there's uh, a conflict of some kind or a, or a um, what's it called? Um, oh, what's it called? Um, contradiction of some kind. They just ignore it. And that's mostly unhelpful um, because we don't learn from that. And other people just – they get more doubts about God in the Bible, not less doubts. So, you know, it, it, when, when we're looking at these different things, how can we say that God is loving and yet that he still brings justice? And so these are things that, that we can't just gloss over and give an easy answer to. These should require our thought, thought processes too. Um, God doesn't require for us to be stupid or to be, um, you know, just blind faith. In fact, most of the things that he requires us to have faith in are not blind. You know, when he said, hey, have faith in Jesus, he didn't say, and by the way, I'm not sending him. <laughs> He said, "Have faith in Jesus," that he had said. So, <laughs> like there is a there's a connection there. Um, so there's there's a dose of reality in in those in those common glimpses that we've looked at here. Let's look at some of them. God doesn't love suffering. That is true, and it doesn't please him to punish the wicked. God doesn't get any pleasure from punishing wicked people. Um, Ezekiel talks about this, and then we were talking about in Peter somewhere. I was talking with someone about I can't remember where about how God's patient. Um, you know, uh, about the judgment. I can't remember who I was talking to about that. Um, so then, and then in contrast to the other idea there that, you know, God the dictator, well, God does care about morals, and sin really does offend him. That doesn't mean that he is a dictator, that he doesn't listen. That doesn't, doesn't mean that he, he yells a lot. You know, and remember, Jesus was God. So we see Jesus, for instance, it says, moved with compassion, he said this. And, you know, so when you take that, remember that that's the same that, – that is also true of, of, obviously, God the Father because, you know, Jesus and God the Father, they're not like two different people with two, two different um, characters and that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know how I'm, what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, and then that next thing there, God the hippie. Well, yeah, God is patient with us. And he knows that we will fail because we are not him. But that doesn't mean that he um, – doesn't care how we live or act, and that doesn't mean that he he's cool with us bidding on his mercy. He's patient, but that doesn't mean that he's just like, ah, whatever. Um, so he does allow us the freedom of choice, but those, those choices do have consequences. So if you look at this little dose of reality here and compare it to this common glimpses of God, you can see how people have taken little bits of God that are kind of true, and they just kind of twisted it and built on it and made it into something that it wasn't. Um, like, for instance, God the love bug. Well, God, God is love, yes, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't judge, that he doesn't bring justice, he's a big pushover. See what I mean? And uh, so we would do well to get the whole picture. So the second white lie, then, is, well, you can't judge me. Another way of saying this is I'm above condemnation. I can live however I want is what people are trying to say. And then kind of going along with that, God just loves me. You know, he doesn't, you know, whatever. And it's like, well... The thing about this white, uh, white lie is, it, is it's so – it's so <sighs> twisted. You know what I mean? It's like <sighs> – it's like when it's like the argument about homosexuals, right? It's it always it usually devolves to some kind of an argument about not being loving when the issue isn't whether you love homosexuals or not. That's not the issue. The issue is whether there are some sexual relationships that are not moral. That's the issue. You can love you can love someone and not agree with their lifestyle. The the issue is not whether you ha have compassion on people or whether you love people. That should be a no doubt that Christians should be the first people to love and have compassion on people. But that doesn't mean that you have to throw the baby out with the, with the bathwater. What were you going to say? It's kind of like I keep hearing said, and I'm not sure if it's entirely accurate. Loving the sinner but not the sin. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> I would say that's absolutely accurate. Um, and, yeah. It's just, a, it's just a hard situation because you can either focus on winning the argument and... You know, like for instance, love is love. Well, if love is love, then that means we can have sex with kids and kill kids and animals too. Obviously, love isn't love. That's just a stupid statement. But yet, if you say love is love is not true, then people assume what you're saying. Therefore, you don't love homosexuals, and it's like, ugh, that's not what I'm talking about. So then you're kind of caught in a, in, a, in between. You can either love the person, and um, <coughs> don't. A lot of times, people will mistake what you're what you're 
what you're saying and oh there he's condoning homosexuality or you can clarify the issue and here's the thing if you have to choose between offending Christians and offending the world, choose to offend Christians instead. Because the world doesn't know God, and you're trying to show them God. And religious people who are sniffing their own farts and think that they're just like the absolute epitome of righteousness, you, that's not really your problem. Your problem is to love people. And so if you have to choose, don't try to piss people off. But if it comes down to it, always choose making a way for, for, for the world. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, here's a good example. Um, at, at our funerals that we do. Um, a lot of times, pastors will try to manipulate people into being saved by, you know, you're, he's probably in hell and you're going to, you know, it's like, aha, we got you in the door now. Uh, you, you know, we don't even usually have altar calls in our funerals that we do at our church. The reason for that is because we're not trying to trying to make somebody have a rash thing. We're trying to love people, you know, and there's a complete different approach that goes with that. They have to um, make their own choices. Right, right, right. And, uh, you know, I don't see Jesus doing that, so I really don't think that that's something we should be modeling. Um, so, um, there's kind of two extremes that go along with this. The first one, not realizing that you live in the tension between being justified and still sinning. And the second one, um, that I said that wrong. The second one is claiming Christianity while denying God by your lifestyle. So let me elaborate on that one before I go back to the first one. So the idea is basically, oh, I'm a Christian, but then living in a way that's clearly contrary to what God says. You know what I mean? Like, oh, no, that's really fine. So then the first one would be um, not realizing that you live in the tension between being justified and still sinning and wanting to sin. So there's always going to be something in you, even after you are a, a Christian that, that wants to sin. And there's still going to be every single day where you're sinning. You, you have to keep trusting God. And so there's these two extremes between realizing, yes, I am a sinner, but then not being overcome by guilt and just self-destruction, and staying away from the whole idea of, well, I'm going to sin anyways. So, I mean, there, there's a happy medium between those uh, between those two extremes. So let's look at Romans 8, 1 through 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, this is very important. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So without getting into that um, law of the Spirit thing, I just get the big picture here. Okay, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that means God no longer holds us um, as uh, guilty. And I think that's a good way of saying that. So he does still realize that we are sinners who sin, but Christ's righteousness is kind of like... It's like a plane ticket. You know what I mean? Um, okay, I think that's a pretty good example. So let's let's just consider this passage, what it's really saying here. So in chapter 7, the chapter right before the, this verse, he goes and talks about how we all still sin. And he even talks about how, you know, I do the very thing that I don't want to do, and I don't do the thing that I want to do. And that's where that whole thing happens. So he, he says that we all still sin, but then he comes to chapter 8 and says, therefore there is no, now no condemna condemnation. So how do we know if we are condemned by God or not? Well, if you keep on reading in chapter 8, he talks about the way that our actions show. Now, our actions don't save us, but what's inside inevitably comes out. Does that kind of make sense? And so if you are living in sin and, and proud of it, well, that shows that you're not, that you are condemned before God because you're not you're not living as, as saved. So there's basically two options that everybody has, which is um, living under the law of spirit or um, under the law of uh, the, the law, the, the Old Testament law, okay? Um, sometimes people say, well, I'm not under the, old, under the Old Testament law anymore. Well, that really depends on, on you. <laughs> uh, if you are under the law of the Spirit, you are not condemned. Now, what is the law of the Spirit? It is, um, where is it? Those who trust in Jesus. When you, you trust in Jesus, you are under the law of the Spirit. Um, but if you're living in sin, instead of trusting in Jesus, you are not under the law of the Spirit anymore. You're you are um, under the law of, uh, not that's what I, I was going to say, but you're under um, the Old Testament law, which means that you're still held to the requirements of those things because you've rejected Christ. See what I mean? But the law never made anybody righteous. So you're doomed to a pointless existence of trying to earn, earn, earn righteousness. The only way to get out of that is to stop sinning and turn to Christ and turn to Jesus in faith. And then you'll be under the law of the Spirit. So yes, the, law, the Old Testament law can't condemn us if we're under the law of the Spirit. Um, 
So let's look a little bit more right here. There's there's a few things I want to look at. Number one, is God made a way? Number two, we are to judge ourselves. And number three, we are held accountable. So this is the, the three things I want to look at as, as it applies to the idea of are we um, – can you judge me? Th this – hold on. Let me just go back and read it. Um, uh, can you judge me? Am I above condemnation? And uh, uh, does God still stand as my uh, – uh, is God still the one condemning me? So first off, we are me uh, God, uh, God made a way. It says in John 3.17, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, a lot of times I hear this one um, yanked out of context. The idea is, oh, you know… Jesus is all about loving and that kind of stuff. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying the the first time that Jesus came, he came to make the way. That doesn't mean that that hey, you know, God didn't come to judge us. He doesn't he doesn't judge us. That's not what that means at all. Uh, Jesus came the first time to make a way for those who would believe. So then that takes us to the second part. We are to judge ourselves. This is kind of an important point because Christians eventually get to this place um, as they've been saved for a while where they kind of think, I'm all good. I'm better than this other person. I've got it all together. And so Matthew 7, 5 says this, You, hypocr you hypocrite, first take the plank out, plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So that, that's kind of an important issue. In, in the Bible, it talks about us learning to judge ourselves. And I was reading a book where it talked about the way that the, the sign of, of a maturing Christian is the ability to discern bad attitudes in themselves. Are we being real with ourselves? Are we allowing pride in our hearts, um, envy in our hearts, jealousy in our hearts, and, and writing it off as, hey, it's no big deal? So although we are to be humble and non-judgmental, we are also to be wise, discerning, and judge correctly. The Bible doesn't tell us not to judge. It talks about us not being a judgmental person. We look at that in Romans uh, 2 and uh, here again in Matthew 7. But it also tell, instructs us to judge correctly. Um, and then, in, and then the third part of this. So, God made a way. We are, we are, uh, we are weighing our hearts. And then the third, we are also held accountable, not just, um, not just in front of God. We are also held accountable in front, in front of earthly authorities. So it says here in Matthew 18, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two brothers or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I truly. truly I tell you that if two of you on, on, on earth agree about anything they ask uh, for, it will be done for them uh, by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I, am I with them. So what he's saying there isn't that you have to have two people praying on something. He's saying when there's church discipline going on, where where two of the where the where the two have affir have affirmed that with the witness and everything, um, God is with you in bringing uh, judgment on the one who's in sin. So what this, uh, this is a kind of a big point. God has established authority both in the church, the pastor, board, that kind of stuff, um, and also in the world, president, vice president, so on and so forth. Um, and he's done this on earth to carry out his commands and to bring correction. It, the fact that we are made in the image of God means that, that we are acting in his stead. It, one of the aspects of what it means. It, it, there's a lot of different things that... that, that that statement means we are, that we are made in the image of God. But one of the one of the um, things that it means is that we are acting as God's hands and feet in the world. So when we um, justify a great injustice, that's why God takes that so heavily in the Old Testament laws because you know uh, we're supposed to be acting as as His hands and feet. Um, so to act unjustly is to blaspheme God by our actions. Um, Micah 6 8 says this He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So, obviously, the idea here that, um, hey, you can't judge me, that's just not true. Not only does God judge us, but our authority can judge us. Or, like, for instance, again, when you speed, a police officer judges you, gives you a ticket, and then you go to court, and the judge judges you. God has established the idea of authority, not just in the world, but also in the church. Um, if you go and cause a whole bunch of problems in the church, and the pastor comes and talks to you, and you know, there's some kind of, you know, um, talking to or something, or you get moved, removed from our position or something like that, 
that he has authority to do that. God has established the idea of authority to carry that out. Now, once again, go, that goes back to number the second thing I was talking about is you should be weighing your heart. Um, and you shouldn't just write off your own sins as not a big deal. So is God condemning you? Well, that really depends on how you're living. Can people judge you? Yes. Yes, they can. Um, it's one of those things. However, uh, sometimes people go a little bit extreme with this. We become critics of people. We just complain about people and nitpick everything about them. And, you know, could have said, oh, well, you're just a bad person. And it's like, well, that takes us to a whole different area. Um, so that brings us to the idea of submission to authority. Um which we might look at next week instead of tonight. Yeah, we're going to look at that next week because we've already gone for 20 minutes and I'm wanting to stop going for excesses of 20 minutes. So any questions on um, the idea of the second white line? You can't judge me. No questions? Okay. That takes us to...